Greetings all, Last Outrider here with my How to Play Age of Sigmar. I'm going to, in this video, try to explain everything you need to know to play Age of Sigmar. Now, I don't have the rule book. I have the app right here. You can download both an army maker and all of the rules for Age of Sigmar for free on your phone and just start playing. I thought that was cool. I'm going to skip over setting up the, uh, the terrain and just go straight to the battle begins. Because there are some important quote-unquote mistakes I've been noticing happening a lot in the game. Let's start with setup. Before setting up their armies, both players roll a die. The player that rolls higher must divide the battlefield into two equal side halves. This is important because I've noticed that many people have started saying that whoever rolls higher, like with old fantasy battle, simply chose who goes first. That is no longer the case. Whoever rolls higher divides the map and they give you an three choices of how to divide a map horizontally, vertically, or L-shaped. The higher roller must divide the map. The lower roller must select which side to be on. There's no choice here. That's the way it's done. So let's see. The player then alternates setting up units one at a time, starting with the player that won the earlier die roll. So you do not roll again. Whoever got the highest roll the first time puts down the first unit. Models must be set up in their own territory. Yeah. More than 12 inches from enemy territory. Not six inches from the edge. You just have to be 12 inches away from enemy territory. You can continue setting up units until you have set up all units you want to fight in that battle. Or have run out of space. This is your army. This is important to note. You do not have to set aside your army before the game. You set aside your army during setup. I know because I've done this. Uh, I just take out my whole tray of figures. And I just keep on putting down units until I think I'm done. I do not tell people what I'm putting down beforehand. I do not have to define how many I have. I just say, I'm done. It's a very important tactical point which I've, I, like I said, I've seen a lot of people not doing. Let's go on. Count the number of models in your army. This may come in useful later. Any remaining units that are held in reserve are held in reserve, playing no part unless fate lends a hand. The opposing player can continue to set up units. When they have finished, setup is complete. The player that finishes setting up first always chooses who takes the first turn in the first battle round. That's why you don't designate your units first. Whoever finishes setting up first chooses who goes first. Yeah, these are subtle, subtle points, but they are extremely important in the tactics of the game. Next, the general. Once you have finished setting up all of your units, nominate one of the models set up as your general. Again, you do not nominate your general until after setup and first turn selection is complete. Your general has command ability as described in the rules for the hero phase opposite. 
Oh, there's another thing. This is also important when selecting the instant win criteria. Remember, if one side has 30% more models, I think it is, than the other side, then you can say, I want an instant win scenario. Then the other person must pick a category which, if you meet, you instantly win the game. All of that is determined during setup. It is very important to keep track of that. Let's go on. Glorious victory. In the mortal realms, battles brutal and uncompromising. They are fought to the bitter end with one side able to claim victory because it has destroyed its foe. Or there are no enemy models left on the field of battle. The victor can immediately claim a major victory and the honors and triumphs that are due to them while the defeated must repair back to their lair to lick their wounds and bear the shame of failure. Not death. Failure. Hmm. It has not been possible, if it has not been possible to fight a battle to its conclusion, where the outcome is not obvious, then a result of sorts can be calculated by comparing the number of models removed from play with the number of models originally set up for battle. Expressing these as percentages provides a simple way to determine the winner. Such a victory can only be claimed as a minor victory. For example, if one player lost 75% of their starting models and another player lost 50%, then that player only lost 50% of their models could claim a minor victory, not a major one. With models added to your army during the game, for example, through summoning, reinforcements, reincarnation, and so on, do not, I repeat, do not count towards the number of models in the army, but must be counted amongst the casualties an army suffers. I don't know how many times I've seen that rule misused. People who summon or resurrect count it as the total number of army. No, no. You must write down what was the original amount of armies in that player's army at the beginning of the game and their res and this is great really great when you're fighting undead because the more you kill them it still counts as casualties but it doesn't count for the total number of arm of of models in the army meaning it is pretty easy to get a minor victory against um undead and summoning armies sudden death victories. That's what I was talking about. Sometimes a player may attempt to achieve a sudden death victory. If one army has a third more models than the other, the outnumbered player can choose one objective from the sudden death table after generals are nominated. After generals are nominated. After generals are nominated. Why is that important? because killing a general is one of the sudden death victories. So, the person chooses assassinate, the, the enemy player picks a unit with a hero, wizard, priest, or monster keyword in their army, slay that unit that they pick. Blunt, the enemy player picks a unit with five or more models in their army, slay that unit that they pick. Endure, have at least one model which started the battle on the battlefield still be in play at the end of the sixth battle round. Seize ground. Pick one terrain feature in enemy territory. Have at least one friendly model within three inches of that feature at the end of the battle round. Now, remember, you pick the sudden, <coughs> the sudden death uh, objective the enemy picks the model that you have to kill or the unit that you have to kill or no no but they do not pick the terrain feature in enemy territory that you have to get you pick that not them 
I've seen it a few times where they say, ah, I'm going to pick, you got to go here. No, 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 no. You pick where you have to get into three inches of. Um, at the end of the fourth battle round, not sixth. Next, triumphs. After any sudden death objectives have been chosen, if your army won a major victory in its previous battle, roll a die and look up the results on the triumph table. Now, I've heard lots of people wondering how do you keep track of whether you won the last battle or not, but I guess that's up to the people you play with. Battle rounds. Mighty armies clash together amid a spray of blood and crackle of magic. Okay, so there's going to be six phases. The first is the hero phase, where you cast spells and use heroic abilities. And this is important because I've seen it misused multiple times as well. Here we go. Warhammer Age of Sigmar is played in a series of battle rounds. Each is split into two turns. One of each player, one for each player. At the start of each battle round, both players roll a die, rolling again in the case of a tie. The player that rolls the highest decides who takes the first turn in that battle round. Each turn consists of the following. This is what causes the confusion. As I read earlier during the setup, for the first round, the person who sets up, who, who finishes setting up first, gets to choose who takes the first, who, who goes first. It is only for the second round that you begin to roll. And that's also important because I've also seen games where people just, you know, keep the same first, second, first, second order every single time. No, you roll a die each round starting with the second round to determine who gets to choose who goes first. These are very important and have been... Yeah, it's very important. Um, especially when you consider the, you know, the sudden death table and meeting those objectives. Because one of them, like the terrain features, which you have to be at the end of, at the... At the end of the first fourth round, you have to be within three inches of. During that time, many times, I select to go second in those rounds. When I believe that I can get within three inches of those. Okay? That means I know I'm going to win at the end of that round. But if you choose to go first, then they get the counter. So if they don't stop you during the first their turn and you can get within three inches of it, the game's yours. Now, once the first player has finished their turn, the second player takes theirs. Once the second player has also finished their, the battle round is over and a new one begins. Now, here's another one. Pre-battle abilities. Many people confuse pre-battle abilities with command abilities. I've noticed. Pre-battle abilities. Some war scrolls allow you to use an ability after setup is complete and it actually has the phrase after setup is complete these abilities are used before the first battle round if both armies have abilities like this both players roll a die the player that rolls highest gets to use their abilities first followed by their opponent now that is true for pre-battle abilities only. It is not true for command abilities. Watch. In your hero phase, you can use your army to, spell, uh, to cast spells. Wizards in your army to cast spells. In addition, other units in your army may have abilities on their roll skulls that can be used in the hero phase. Generally, they can only be used in your own hero phase. However, and I repeat this again. However, if an ability says it can be used in every hero phase, then it can be used in your opponent's hero phase as well as your own. 
So that has been one of the confusing things about the old rules. When it says every phase, does it really mean every phase or does it just mean every one of your phases? In this case, in Age of Sigmar, every phase means every phase. How, uh, ba -ba -ba. If both players can use abilities in a hero phase, the player whose turn it is gets to use all of theirs first. So unlike pre-battle abilities, you do not roll. The player whose turn it is gets to use their abilities first. Period. Then you have command abilities like inspiring presence. Next, movement phase. Start your movement phase by picking one of your units and moving each model in that unit until you have moved all the models you want to. You can then pick another unit to move until you have moved as many of your units as you wish. No model can be moved more than once in each movement phase. A model can be moved in any direction to a distance of inches equal to or less than the move characteristic on its war scroll. It can be moved vertically in order to climb or cross scenery, but cannot be moved across other models. And here's another part that people skip right at the end. They still think that it's center of base to center of base. No, it says very clearly in the last sentence, no part of the model may move further than the model's move characteristic. Okay? So it's it's not center to center, it's 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 tip to tip, which is a change. Enemy models. When you have moved a model in the movement phase, you may not move within three inches of the enemy models. Models from your army are friendly models, and models from the opposing army are enemy models. Units starting the movement phase within three inches of an enemy model can either remain stationary or retreat. If you choose to retreat, the unit must mend its move more than three inches away from all enemy units. If a unit retreats, it cannot shoot or charge later that turn. But the thing that people overlook is that it can choose to remain stationary. Now why is that important? That's important when you choose who's going to go first. You see, if you have a model that's within three inches of another model for some reason, it's probably best for you to choose to go second. Because that means the other player must remain stationary or retreat. If you choose to go first, then you are the one who has to choose to remain stationary or retreat. Again, this all comes down to tactics. And it's something you got to think about. Da, da, da. So let's go on next. Running. When you pick a unit to move in the movement phase, you can declare that it will run. Roll a dice and add the result to the movement characteristic of all models in the unit for the movement phase. A unit that runs cannot shoot or charge later that turn. Flying. If a roll scroll for a model says that a model can fly, it can pass across models and scenery as if they were not there. It may still not finish a move within three inches of an enemy in the movement phase. And if it is already within three inches of an enemy, it can only retreat or remain stationary. Now, I've come up with an interesting um, situation with this. Remember where it says that during movement, it includes moving vertically. This means that if you're flying and you land on top of a rock or uh, a ruin or a building, if you're over three inches up, 
but within three inches vertic uh, horizontally, you're okay. Because vertical movement counts as movement. Don't forget that. It's another, again, tactical nuance, but it's one I've seen people screw up on. Shooting phase. In your shooting phase, you can shoot with models armed with missile weapons. Pick one of your units. You may not pick a unit that ran or retreated that turn. Each model in the unit's attack in the unit attacks with all, all of the missile weapons it is armed with. After all the models in the unit have shot, you can choose another unit to shoot with until all units sh have shooting have done so. Now, this is important because you may notice that many units have two weapons. Well, at least mine do, because I, I play Chaos Dwarves, and they come with a pistol and a fire staff thingy. If they're within range, they shoot both of them. This also goes to hand-to-hand -hand weapons. If you have two hand-to-hand -hand weapons, you use all of them. You don't pick one. Charge phase. Howling blood-curdling war cries. Warriors hurl themselves into battle to slay with blade, hammer, and claw. Any of your units within 12 inches of the enemy in your charge phase may make a charge roll. Now, one thing that I've noticed again is that pre-measuring is allowed now. You don't have to guess if you're within 12 inches. But you still have to roll to see if you make your charge. Pick an eligible unit, roll two dice. Each model in the unit can move this number of inches. You may not pick a unit that ran or retreated this turn, nor one that is within three inches of the enemy. The first model you move must finish within a half inch. Not base to base touching, but a half inch of an enemy model. Yes, I've seen the base to base thing happen. If that's impossible, the charge has failed and no models in the charging unit can move in this phase. Once you have moved all your models in the unit, you can pick another eligible unit and make a charge until all units that can charge have done so. Combat phase. Carnage engulfs the battlefield as the warring armies tear each other apart. Urgh. Any unit that has charged or has models within three inches of an enemy unit, can attack with its melee weapons in the combat phase. This is important because you can choose to retreat or remain stationary. If you chose to remain stationary and the other model is still there, combat ensues. When the opposing player uh, the, player whose turn it, the player whose turn it is picks a unit to attack with. Then the opposing player must attack with a unit. And so on, until eligible units on both sides have attacked one another. Now, this is tricky. Because the default understanding i found when people read this is that when... That person chooses to attack, I must attack, counterattack back to that unit. But that is not what the rule says. What the rule says is the player whose turn it is picks a unit to attack with. Then the opposing player must attack with a unit. This does not have to be a unit that was just attacked. It's very important because if you have multiple charges, like three charges, and then the person charging me has picked this unit to attack, I must choose to counterattack, but I choose a completely different unit to counterattack with. Since I played dwarves, uh, with with lower initiative, 
this has evened out the odds. Well, not initially, but you know what I mean. You don't have to counterattack with the same unit that was attacked with. You can, com you can pick a completely different unit and get the first attack in that round. Now, obviously, if there's only one charge, then you have to counterattack. If one side completes all of its attacks first, then the other side completes all of its remaining attacks. One unit after another. No unit can be selected to attack more than once in each combat phase. An attack is split into two steps. First, the unit piles in. Then, you make attacks with the models in the unit. Step one, when you pile in, you may move every model in the unit up to three inches towards the closest enemy model. This will allow the models in the unit to get closer to the enemy in order to attack them. Now, it's been kind of interesting because if you go back to the sudden death table and the seize territory objective, it says pick one terrain feature in enemy territory have at least one friendly model within three inches of that feature at the end of the fourth round of battle. It doesn't say it has to be alone. There has been one game where I charge to that to a unit that's protecting that it was a tree, okay, and then I use my follow-up move to move to within four inches, uh, three inches of the tree. Combat was still going on at the end of the first fourth phase because I went um, second and I just used my follow-up move and I didn't have to because when it says towards the closest enemy model, this allows the models in the, yeah, I won. Sudden death, even in the middle of combat simply because I used my follow-up move to get within the three inches of the objective and the fourth phase ended because I was the second I was the second half and that was sudden death. Bam. Step two, each model in the unit attacks with all the melee weapons it is armed with. <coughs> just like with shooting, that's all of them. You don't choose one. If you have more than one, just like uh, like chaos dwarves have uh, uh, have the spite shield and and uh, and the blades, they hit with both. Battle shock phase. Even the bravest of heart may quail when the horrors of battle take their toll. In the battle shock phase, both players must take battle shock tests for units from their army that have had models slain during the turn. The player whose turn it is, tests first. To make a battle shock test, which is important because if you have the two turns, you remember on the first turn, that player tests first. On the second turn, you test first. To make a battle shock test, roll a dice and add the number of models from the unit that have been slain this turn. For each point by which the total exceeds the highest bravery characteristic in the unit, one model in that unit must flee and be removed from play. Add one to the bravery characteristic being used for every ten models that are in the unit when, when the test is taken. You must choose which models flee from the units you command. Attacking. Blows hammer down upon the foe, inflicting bloody wounds. When a unit attacks, you must first pick the target units for the attacks that the model in the unit will make. Then, make all of the attacks and finally inflict any resulting damage on the target units. 
The number of attacks a model can make is determined by the weapons that it is armed with. And as I said before, you use all weapons. The weapon options a model has are listed on its description on its war scroll. Missile weapons can be used in the shooting phase, and melee weapons can be used in the combat phase, unless you're a KS Dwarf player like me, and they can be used in both phases. The number of attacks a model can make is equal to the attack characteristic for the weapons it can use. Picking targets. First, you must pick the target units for the attack. In order to attack an enemy unit, an enemy model from that unit must be in range of the attacking weapon. Okay? And, and visible to the attacker. If you're unsure, stoop down and look from behind the attacking model to see if it can see the target. But, <laughs> but, because once again, there has been confusion about this, for the purposes of determining visibility, an attacking model can see through other models in its unit. If a model has more than one attack, you can split them between potential target units as you wish. If a model splits its attacks between two or more enemy units, resolve all of the attacks against one unit before moving on to the next one. And I read all of the attacks as all of the attacks. Not all of the attacks that this model is making but all of the attacks, period. Making attacks. Attacks can be made one at a time, or in some cases, you can roll the dice of four attacks together. The following attack sequence is used to make attacks one at a time. First, hit roll. Roll a dice. If the roll equals or beats the attacking weapon's two-hit characteristic, then it scores a hit, and you must make a wound roll. If not, the attack fails, and the attack sequence ends. 2. Wound roll. Roll a die. If the roll equals or beats the attacking weapon's two-wound characteristic, then it causes damage, and the opposing player must make a save roll. If not, the attack fails and the attack sequence ends. I also like that. That's a nice change. Instead of comparing it to toughness, everything is determined by the weapon alone, which is much easier. Save roll. The opposing players roll a dice, modifying the roll by the attacking weapon's rend characteristic. For example, if a weapon has a negative one rend characteristic, then one is subtracted from the save roll. If the result equals or beats the save characteristic of the models in the target's unit, the wound is saved and the attack sequence ends. If not, the attack is successful and you must determine damage on the target unit. Pretty straightforward, you would think, right? <sighs> but there has been one question about this. It says, hit roll, roll a die. If the roll beats or equals the attacker's two hit characteristic, then it scores a hit, and you must make a wound roll. If not, the attack fails, and the attack sequence ends. So I guess that... Never mind. Determining damage. Once all of the attacks made by a unit have been carried out, each successful attack inflicts a number of wounds equal to the damage characteristic of the weapon. Most weapons have a damage characteristic of one, but some inflict two or more wounds, allowing them to cause grievous injuries even to the mightiest foe, or to cleave through more than one opponent with a single blow. In order to make several attacks at once, all of the attacks must have the same to hit, to wound, 
rend, and damage characteristics and must be directed at the same enemy unit. Unit, not model. If this is the case, make all of the two hit rolls at the same time. Then roll all of the wound rolls, and finally all of the save rolls, and then add up the total number of wounds caused, inflicting damage. After all of the attacks made by a unit have been carried out, the player commanding the target unit allocates any wounds that are inflicted to models from a unit as they see fit. The models do not have to be within range or visible of an attacking unit. I'll say that again for clarity's sake. The models that the opposing player, or you, when you go to allocate wounds, do not have to be within range of the weapon that was attacking the unit or even visible to the attacking unit. Just get that out of the way right now. Once the number of wounds suffered by a model during the battle equals its wounds characteristic, the model is slain. Place the model on one to one side. It is removed from play. Some war scrolls include abilities that allow wounds to be healed. A healed wound no longer has any effect. You can't heal wounds on a model that has been slain. Okay? It's done. There is no I'll be back roll. If a <laughs> sorry, if a model is slain, it's gone. No ability that heals after a fact can get rid of it. So if you're doing your healing effects, you reduce the number of wounds before you allocate them. Mortal wounds. Some attacks inflict mortal wounds. Do not make hit, wound, or save rolls for a mortal wound. The important one means don't make even a hit wound. When something says this inflicts mortal wounds, it just directly takes those wounds. Allocate the wounds to the models from the target unit as described above, but they still allocate it. So it can still be allocated to a model that is out of the unit's range and out of sight of the model inflicting the damage. Cover. If all models in a unit are within or on a terrain feature, you can add one to all save rolls for that unit to represent the cover they receive from the terrain. This, model, this modifier does not apply in the combat phase if the unit you are making saves for made a charge move that same turn. Wizards. The realms are saturated with magic, a seething source of power for those with the wit to wield it. Some models are noted as being a wizard on their war scroll. You can use a wizard to cast spells in your hero phase and can also use them to unbind spells in your opponent's hero phase. The number of spells a wizard can attempt to cast or unbind each turn is detailed on the war scroll. Actually, that reminds me. All Any model you nominate as a general automatically has one command ability which allows a unit within inspiring presence pick a unit from your army that is within 12 inches of your general the unit that you pick does not have to make battle shot tests until your next hero phase so i've seen that happen sometime People forget that, especially if they don't have a hero model or a general model in their army. They still get inspiring presence. 
anybody you nominate as a general automatically can do that. Casting spells. All wizards can use the spells described below, as well as any spells listed on their roll scroll. A wizard can only attempt to cast each spell once per turn. To cast a spell, roll two dice. If the total is equal to or greater than the casting value of the spell, the spell is successfully cast. If a spell is cast, the opposing player can choose any one of their wizards within 18 inches of the caster and that can see them and attempt to unbind the spell before its effects are applied. To unbind a spell, roll two dice. If the roll beats the roll used to cast the spell, then the spell effects are negated. Only one attempt can be made to unbind a spell. And the two spells that everybody knows are Arcane Bolt and Mystic Shield. The most important rule... Oh, wait. There's one more. No, that's it. The most important rule. In a game as detailed and wide-ranging as Warhammer Age of Sigmar, there are many times when you are not sure exactly how to resolve a situation that has come up. When this happens, have a quick chat with your opponent and apply the solution that makes the most sense to you both. Or, and more importantly for me, the one that seems the most fun. If no single solution presents itself, both, you, both of you should roll a die, and whomever rolls higher gets to choose what happens. Then you can get on with the fighting. This is the most important rule because it means there is no arguing in this game. None. At least I don't allow it in the, that I played. If First of all, these rules are simple and straightforward enough that I don't really have a problem with them. But if there is, you simply say, it's not the, it's not the hand of fate anymore. It's not roll a die, you know, whoever rolls higher. You roll and they roll. Whoever rolls higher gets to choose the interpretation and what happens for that instance. Remember that. And do not argue, because as it says right there, this is the most important rule, which means it is more important than any rule the other person wants to argue about. Remind them of that. And enjoy the game. Until next time, bye.